Jermaine, you should think about that. I've, I've told you, you know, when you're in a band, you don't get with your bandmate's girlfriend, past or present. Yes, well, thanks for that. You get a love triangle, you know? Fleetwood Mac situation. Although there was four of them, so more of a love square, but, you know, no one gets on. OK, I see. Mind you, they did make some of their best music back then. Rumours? No. That's no, all true. Uh, that's pretty much the cliff notes of the production of this album, to be honest. But I'm here to talk about the history, the music, the legacy, and the aftermath of the album. My name is Anderson Azello. Welcome to Album Essentials. This is Rumours. How do rumours get started? They started by the jealous people and they get... Not that rumours! This rumours! The one of the second you by Fleetwood Mac! Much better. Fleetwood Mac will be an interesting band to cover here as they've gone through a number of musical phases and the greatest hits album focuses on the most well-known period and the most well-known albums. The band started as a blues group before going for a smoother pop sound and that's the part of the band's discography that everyone celebrates. While the second self-titled album was a success that created a new social camaraderie in the group, the follow-up album would be a masterpiece built upon chaos. Rumors with a second U is Fleetwood Mac's 11th studio album that was released on February 4th, 1977. It confirmed to music critics that the band could sustain the previous album's successes and is at number 26 in the Rolling Stone 500 Greatest Albums of All Time and Time Magazine's All Time 100 Albums and is part of the Library of Congress's National Recording Registry. It always confused me why this soft rock album was so revered and what went down and what not to mention who went down in the recording studio to produce this album. And that's why I'm here. Fleetwood Mac has had a long and varied career has shifted through many musical styles and members. For this video of Album Essentials, I'll be focusing on the pop period, but I will touch upon the foundation of the band. Crawling up a hill. John Mayall and the Blues Breakers was a band that formed in 1963. The band consisted of Mayall singing, Hughie Flint on drums, and John McVie on bass guitar. And there was also a guitarist who had been a member of the Yardbirds, but he was replaced by Peter Green early on. Hughie Flint was replaced by Ainsley Dunbar, who then left the group to play alongside Jeff Beck and a young Rod Stewart, and would play with artists like Frank Zappa, David Bowie, Lou Reed, Journey, and numerous others. Green had played with Mick Fleetwood and two previous other bands, and brought him in to be the new drummer. In appreciation for the work on the album A Hard Road, Mayall gave Green a free period of studio time to use. Green, Fleetwood, and McVie used the time to record five songs. One of these songs was an instrumental piece called Fleetwood Mac. After finishing these songs, Green suggested the three form an entirely new band. However, McVie was hesitant and wanted to stay with Mayall for the financial security. Bob Brennan took the role as bassist but later left when McVie came back to be a permanent member. Trio, along with the other members, recorded three albums between 1967 and 1969. The first album was self-titled and contained a mixture of blues standards and songs composed by Green and Jeremy Spencer. In 1970, the first step that led to lineup changes began when Peter Green took LSD in Munich, which might have contributed to his schizophrenia. Bob Brunning recalled, The truth about Peter Green and how he ended up how he did is very simple. We were touring Europe in late 1969. When we were in Germany, Peter told me he had been invited to a party. I knew there were going to be a lot of drugs around, and I suggested that he didn't go. But he went anyway. I understand from him that he took what it turned out to be very bad, impure LSD. It was never the same again. Also in 1970, McVie married Christine Perfect. She was previously a member of the band Chicken Shack and released a Soa album that year. 
She also started playing keyboard for Fleetwood Mac starting in 1968 on the album Mr. Wonderful. And oh god, he's got a stunning album cover! Go away! The power of better artwork compels you! This is actually one of the most famous album artworks of all time. Spencer had left the band at this point as he stepped out to get a magazine and then ended up joining the Children of God, a religious cult now known as the Family International. Whatever is in that magazine must have made a very convincing argument. Christine joined the band as a full-time member in 1970, and Bob Welch replaced Green in 1971 with the album Future Games. This album was less bluesy due to Welch's influence. Fleetwood, the man himself, said of Welch, it was a totally different background, R&B, sort of jazzy. He brought his personality. In 1973, Lindsey Buckingham and Stevie Nicks released Buckingham Nicks. That's Stevie and that's Lindsey. Please don't get them mixed up. I know I have. The album was a flop, but Fleetwood liked the track Flows in Love so much he asked Buckingham to join the band. The image on the cover could have also influenced Fleetwood's decision. Buckingham said they would only join the band on condition that his girlfriend, Stevie Nicks, would also become part of the band. The stipulation was accepted and the pair replaced Bob Welch, who had become tired of touring and the legal struggles involved with the band's name. In 1975, the band released Fleetwood Mac, their second self-titled album, and the first album of the group's pop period. This album showcased how the band had transformed. The album reached number one in the U.S. and had hits such as Over My Head, Say You Love Me, and Rhiannon. Not Rihanna, Rhiannon! Sheesh. The pronunciation ain't that bad. Excuse me. Stevie Nicks, who wrote the song, got the name from a book titled Triad and learned that the name was borrowed from that of a Welsh goddess. I really liked it, thought that's a really beautiful name, sat down, t t about 10 minutes later wrote Rihanna. It's one of the songs she performs in American Horror Story, in which she plays a witch. It's been long speculated that Stevie Nicks has an interest in witchcraft, but she's firmly denied this rumor. With one you. In 1976, Christy McVie divorced from John McVie. Buckingham and Nicks were having an off-on relationship and wish they fun a lot, and Fleetwood found his woman and best friend in bed and having fun. In bed and having fun. Now don't you get any ideas. Shame on you. Rumors was recorded from February to August of 1976 and the romantic tension took a toll on the band's professional relationship. The band did not socialize with the band was recording and the members indulged in cocaine heavily. Chris Stone, who owned the recording studio, said that the band would come in at 7 at night, have a big feast, party until 1 or 2 in the morning, and then were so whacked out they couldn't do anything, they started recording. If I could only do that well with my work. So, how did rumors sound once everything passed through the grapevine? Ugh. Just move to the next section already. According to author Jacob Hoy, who wrote 100 Greatest Albums, the first two lyrics of the first song, Secondhand News, sets the tone for the entire album. The song was written by Lindsey Buckingham and was inspired by his atonement after breaking up with Stevie Nicks. Secondhand News refers to being a step lower on the relationship ladder. Buckingham states that the song features Irish and Scottish folk song influences, but sounds like a lot like American country songs, especially with its music on the Monopia. It should be noted that country music takes a lot from Irish and Scottish folk songs. It really makes this song a toe tapper. That does beg the question who left who exactly? Dreams is the second track on the album, the number one hit off the album. It's written by Stevie Nicks and can be seen as a response to secondhand news. Nix is perfectly fine with Lindsay leaving her, but she's saying the separation will drive him nuts. Of your love. 
nice and relaxed song that makes the singer seem unaffected by the other person's actions. Like a witch casting a spell upon a scorned lover. How apt. It's pronounced washes. You don't say what are or wait word or wa Luigi. I can't say it weird without it sounding forced. Then we're going back again to the guitar picking track by Buckingham and sort of an echo of the older roots of early Fluid Mac. That's also a song that can be seen as a counter response to that of Dreams. The first three tracks of them make seem like a musical divorce proceeding. Also, the brevity of the song makes it seem like a closing statement rather than an actual rebuttal. Christine McVie interrupts the separating artist with Don't Stop, which is about her feelings about separating from John McVie after eight years. It's a rather optimistic song about moving forward after a failed relationship. It's a good song to uplift someone after an upsetting separation, and probably was a way for Christine to love some steam musically. Christine McVie plays the piano while her ex plays bass. Lindsay sings the track and is probably also feeling relieved singing the song because of his own separation. Go Your Own Way is another song by Buckingham that details his views about his breakup with Nixon and can be seen as a GTFO song. Buckingham later said, I had to do a lot of things for Nick that I really didn't want to do, and yet I did them. So on one level I was completely professional in rising above that, but there was a lot of pent-up frustration and anger towards TV and me for many years. At one point, Nick wanted the following lyrics to be removed. Nick despised his verse, saying, Buckingham knew it wasn't true. It was just an angry thing that he said. Every time those words would come on stage, I wanted to go over and kill him. Personally, the song sounds to be a mix of restrained anger and hidden depression. He's like saying, Get out of here! But I really don't want you to go! As if he's been sitting on the fence for so long that the picket is starting to enter his anus. Ugh. The last song on the first side of the vinyl release is Songbird, written and sung by Christine McVie. It's a soft and solemn piano piece that describes the blessing that a loving relationship hopefully provides. It ends up being a rather sad song, and Christine is lamenting her breakup and now talks about true love conquering all while the ruins of relationships surround her and the band. It makes for a sobering track before the intermission of flipping the vinyl. The Chain sounds like the intro song to a neo-western movie with its acoustic guitar mixed with electric guitar. But a sci-fi comic book movie works just as well. The writing of the song is credited to the whole band and can be said the keystone of the whole album and its themes. Buckingham, Christine McVie, and Nix sing on the track and their combined vocal performances can be said as a metaphor for the great confusion of their breakups, with their broken promises and the weakest link of the emotional chain unable to be identified. 
The story goes that during the rehearsals for the rumor sessions, when things started to get chaotic, they would just play this song to calm their nerves and tensions. As the song continues, it grows into a powerful marching tune. This could have planted the seed of the title track from Tusk. The emotions continue the climax as a stampede of instrumentation erupts as the emotions of everyone come to a head. The next song on the album is written by Christine McVie and was inspired in an affair she had with Curry Grant, the lighting director for the band's live shows. Now John McVie did not know about this affair for a long time, so to cover it for herself she said it was about her dog. Wait, hold on a second. It's a good thing this song isn't about affair, otherwise this would be about bestiality! Uh, Christine, this feeling you feel, is it the joy of having an affair, or the guilt of having an affair and making you, um, John McVie think you're having sex with your dog? Alright, 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 I'm joking about the bestiality thing, and it's very easy to see this song about relishing an affair. And besides, I can't believe John McVie actually fell for that excuse at the time. The track is a nice soft rock tune that can also be interpreted out by the blessings of relationship in a happier context when compared to Songbird. I Don't Wanna Know was actually written before Buckingham and Nick's joined Fleetwood Mac. It was clicked on the album to replace the track Silver Springs due to the length. Hey, these were the days before CDs. You only really fit about 45 minutes of music on a vinyl record. And since I mentioned it already, we'll get to Silver Springs when we get to the end of the regular track list. It's on special editions of the album and releases, so it counts. The penultimate track on the album is Oh Daddy, written by Christy McVie, and she said it was written for Mick Fleetwood. Fleetwood had two dollars at the time, and the song is meant to be heard from the point of view of the children. Oh, Daddy, you soothe me with your smile. You're letting me know you're the best thing in my life. However, it's also been said that the song was also written for Courtney Grant. I really hope this song was written for Fleetwood Mick. I mean, Fleetwood Mac. I mean, Mick Fleetwood. Sorry. The final track of the album is Gold Dust Woman, written by Stevie Nicks. It sounds like yet another western movie track of the Gold Dust Woman being a soiled dove of the saloon. According to Stevie Nicks, the gold dust of the song refers to... <sighs> oh. Cocaine. Remind me not to take a train today. 
Gold Dust one was my kind of symbolic look at somebody going through a bad relationship, doing a lot of drugs and trying to make it, trying to live, trying to get through it. Send next. I have never considered cocaine to be a good way to cope with a bad relationship. I always thought that alcoholism was the standard operating procedure for these kinds of relationships. The song then devolves into a madness mantra of ramblings as the titular character realizes what's happening to her. To do. Don't jump the gun on me. Silver Spring was written by Stevie Nicks and released as a B-side of Go Your Own Way. The name of the track comes from the town of Silver Spring in Maryland, which Nicks happened to notice while traveling in the state. The song is Nicks' closing statement in the divorce of the relationship with Buckingham, and the lack of the song's inclusion of rumors further drove a wedge into the band. Hmm, but what about the song itself? The song is a soft but rageful declaration about how the singer, next, can fulfill all of someone else's desires, Buckingham's, and this can be a happy relationship. However, that someone else wants to be with a different person. In retaliation, the singer says that they'll haunt the other person with the fact that they could have been a happy couple, the music intensifying and becoming more angry but still disappointed. Richard Dasha, the co-producer and album engineer, said it was the best song that never made it into a record album. I tend to agree, as it makes for a great coda for all the emotional turmoil that we now know went through the band. So with all this beautiful finger pointing, how did the critics react when they heard rumors? Rumors as in the album itself and not the turmoil that happened during the production of the album. Just take a look at this rating chart on Wikipedia. It was well reviewed all across the board. The album reached number one on Billboard and stayed at the top for 31 non-consecutive weeks. It also reached number one spot in Canada, United Kingdom, and New Zealand. Look, I don't know how they do things back in England. New, New Zealand. Zealand. Yeah, whatever. I don't really give a Billboard, Record World, and Cashbox all listed Rumors as the number one album on 1977. Finally, in 1978, it won the Grammy Award for Album of the Year. But what about the more personal reviews? Robert Christgau of The Village Voice said that the album jumps right out of the speakers at you, with John Swenson of The Rolling Stone saying that rumors proves that the success of Fleetwood Mac, the band's previous album, was no fluke. 
Despite the unending praise, Robert Hilburn of the LA Times said the album was frustratingly uneven. Personally, I think he just didn't care for the multi-singer, multi-song style composition of the album. I hate to think what do we think of a Alan Parsons project album. Juan Rodriguez of Canada's The Gazette said the concepts in the songs are slightly more muddled than the previous albums, but again, I feel this is due to a personal taste and the fact that the band members were at each other's throats. In modern reviews, the album has consistently placed highly in greatest albums of all times lists, alongside heavy hitters like Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, The Clash's London Calling, and of course, Beatles' Sgt. Pepper's. I was personally confused with the reverence of the soft rock album initially, just as much as I was confused with how highly regarded Pet Sound was. But with a few good turns in my head, I'd say to say that it's good to listen to rumors. With a second you. After two home runs by Fleetwood Mac, the group decided to be more daring in the next project. The follow-up to rumors would be more experimental, more intricate, and more longer than anything else that they had produced. Their next album could be considered Fleetwood Mac's White Album, but that is a review for another time because I am tired of sinking my tusks into these rumors. Rumors is a soft rock masterpiece that proves that it is possible to salvage something from disintegrating relationships. That salvageable item being an album that you can sell to cover for the counseling costs. The album is pretty much a musical form of therapy, with an introspective view of relationships and the various dynamics that stem from their creations and destructions. While the whole album is great, Dreams, Go Your Own Way, Don't Stop, and The Chain are the most memorable songs on the album. The genre is a collection of country, folk, blues, and rock that create a series of emotional hills and valleys, which have something for everyone in every relationship status. While Silver Springs wasn't on the original album's release, it's on most reissues and doesn't take anything away from the original album. Fleetwood Mac really came into its own with the pop rock era, with the first greatest hits album taking many of its songs from rumors, the album that came before it, and the three albums that came afterward. While those albums are not as well revered or as even as rumors, Trying to match such a musical accomplishment is next to impossible, so it makes sense why they didn't try to capture lightning in the bottle again with the next album. My name is Anderson Nozello. Thank you for watching Album Essentials. The band released Fleetwood Mac, their second self-titled album, the first album of the first... It's a nice and relaxed song that makes the singer seem unaffected by the other person's action. Like a witch casting a spell on a scorned lover. How apt. So with all this beautiful pinga... pinga-pointing?